Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Patrick. I'm a little alcoholic. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. I'd like to welcome the newcomers. Congratulations on the special occasion. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here and to carry on the legacy that was given to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, the second part of the alcoholic story is not much good without the first part. So he goes to work, and he eats his breakfast, and he makes his bed, and he pays his bills, and he does everything the way it should be done. That's kind of boring, you know. That's been my life, sort of, for the past 22 years. But you have to look at what came before that. And then, then it, then it becomes interesting. And, you know, <laughs> 22 years sober, there's a lot of, a lot of the alcoholism, a lot of the, the drinking and the Saturday night blackout and the police cars and the forgetting where the night began and where the next day started out. You know, it's, it's been a while. But it's a part of my story, and I'll never forget it. And um, <clears throat> my journey started out in in the Irish Republic, and it's an amazing thing. We stay, you know, meeting makers. We say a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous. Meeting makers make it, and there's a whole lot of different suggestions, but staying sober, I found a lot of pieces to the puzzle, and I spent the first six months of my recovery in a men's recovery home in San Diego, and, you know, if you're new and you have the option of going into an alcohol recovery home, it's it's a fabulous thing to do. Now, I called my mother in Ireland, and I said, Mother, I'm in an alcohol recovery home in San Diego. And I'm thinking, you know, her world is going to fall apart. And she said, Thank God! (laughs) (laughs) And they told me there how this works. People came... And they shared their experience, strength, and hope. And I sat there and I listened. And because the journey of living life without alcohol is challenging. It's the most incredible. The opposite of drunk is fierce. I'm not sober like a judge. I got fierce about living and about doing simple things. And poetry, you know, that's part of my story. I spent the first 10 years of my recovery writing poetry at the coffee shops down in PB. And my mother came to visit and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing poetry. She says, well, that's not going to get you any security. And I said, well, maybe not. <clears throat> she said, I took her to the airport. She says, Patrick, you'd look good in one of those uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> Guy carrying a suitcase. Yeah, um, so I was 
grew up on a dairy farm in Ireland. And, and one day, instead of going to school, I went to the pub. And the thing about the pubs in Ireland was that it could be summer or it could be winter, but it was always the same in the pub. The, no light got in there. The temperature was just kind of right, and it didn't really matter. It could be a sunny day or it could be snowing. The pub was just perfect. <laughs> And you could pass a whole season in the damn pub. <laughs> and I went to the pub. I'm the eldest son. I have five brothers. I had five brothers. And <clears throat> I'm, I walk in there and I'm 15 years old and I walk up to the bar and I really don't know what I'm doing and it's, said, I'll take a pint of beer. Okay. He's a little nervous, you know, but they don't check ID back in 1979 in <clears throat> the Irish Republic. You have the money to pay for it. You're in. So there's one other client in the pub besides myself, <clears throat> and he's standing there drinking Guinness. So I'm watching this guy, and because I'm trying to figure this out, like, how do you do this? So he picks up his pint of Guinness, and he takes a good drink, and he puts it back down, and so I pick my drink up and drink some of that and put it back down. And about half an hour goes by, and nobody says a word, and <clears throat> the guy turns to me. He's an old man. He says, what's that stuff you're drinking? I said, well, it's beer. He says, you know, that's not a man's drink. <clears throat> I said, so what's a man's drink? He says, Guinness is the only man's drink there is. <laughs> so he says, I've got to tell you a story about drinking. When I was a young fella, not much older than you, me and a couple of the boys said, we're going to see who's a man here. So we went to the pub and put our money down and said, keep those pints coming. So Jimmy drank 20 pints of Guinness and collapsed in the corner. And Tommy drank two more pints and went and puked it all up on the wall. And what did you do? Well, I drank 24 pints of Guinness and got on my bicycle and rode home. <laughs> And I had found a role model. <laughs> and I spent many the long year trying to drink like a gentleman. I didn't try riding a bicycle after 24 pints of Guinness. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was 21 and there was a lot of stuff going on in Ireland. There was a lot of fighting and there was a lot of politics and a lot of stuff. And my mother says to me, Patrick, why don't you go to New York? And I said, wow, what a good idea. Now, my father had different ideas. He says, look, if you want the farm, it's yours. And I said, you know, I'm going to New York. <clears throat> so I was drinking all that I could. And I was smuggling goods across the border, and I was collecting unemployment. And I was relatively content and, but I did what my mother suggested, and I moved to New York City. I went to the Bronx in 1984, and there was a little Irish community up there and about 50 bars on three blocks, and <laughs> I fit in in New York City. And I spent seven years in New York City, 
And <clears throat> it's Saturday night, and there are people that could have been here in this room that just didn't get the opportunity. And, you know, I went to a room like this in New York City. And I sat in one of these chairs, and somebody's up there telling a story about hiding booze and the bathroom and telling the wife some story. And I put my hand up. I said, excuse me. And, and the guy keeps talking. I said, hey, hey. So he says, what, what? I said, I'm going down to McSorley's Ale House, and anybody that wants to come with me, I'll buy the drinks. And I got up and left the meeting. <laughs> and a guy followed me out, and he says, hey. I said, what? He says, you don't have to go. And I said, are you coming with me? He says, no. I said, well, then you better get back in there. So I went down to McSorley's. And ten years later, <clears throat> and some insane days and nights, and I tried again. And um, <clears throat> so it says in the literature, in our book, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. And a, a sentence like that, or two sentences like that, were very confusing to me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. What does that mean? What is your innermost self? And I know today what that means. That means I am an alcoholic and I need help. That's what that means. And that's the first step. And we can help you here. And then these steps that follow. And um, <clears throat> there's a, a tradition, there's a native Indian tradition called a vision quest. Crying for a vision, they call it. <clears throat> Where somebody has no name and no identity. And they go out alone and they spend time until they see something. And they find the thing that gives them the identity. And me, <clears throat> I would look in the classified. <clears throat> like, I have no job, I need a job. So I look in the classified. And I start with the A, and I work down through the, let's see, uh, Baker's assistant. Mm. Let's see. Courier. I tried a lot of different things looking for my identity. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I sat in these chairs. <clears throat> and I took the suggestions. And the first decision that I ever made in my life was the decision to do the fourth step. And that was a difficult decision, but it was one, the only one left for me was to go ahead and do the next indicated thing. And this is a simple program. Alcoholism lives in here. And, you know, a lot of the work that we do, we do it on our own. Nobody can write your fourth step for you. Nobody can do your fearless and searching moral inventory. 
And that's a lonely journey and difficult. But we are here together and, you know, all the suggestions begin with we. So, I mean, I wrote my fourth step. <clears throat> and I did the work myself. And I talked to people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's confusing stuff. Like they said, hey, get phone numbers and call. Call those numbers. So here's how, you know, I call somebody. It's a Wednesday or it's a Friday or it's Sunday and I'm at the beach. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to call somebody. <clears throat> so I called this number. And the phone rang and the guy answered. He says, who is this? I said, well, this is the guy from the meeting. Well, what's going on? Are you drinking? No, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm at the beach. You know, it's a pay phone down at the beach. Well, I'm at work here. I mean, uh, is, is there something going on that you need to talk about? Well, not really. I was just calling. That's all. I mean, that's what you said to do. Well, hey, I'll, I'm busy here. I'll, I'll talk to you at the meeting. Okay, bye. But you know what? I had done a very unusual thing. I had called another alcoholic. And I um, I was at a meeting some days ago, and somebody came up to me and says, "How how did you do it?" And I said, "You know, this is how I did it, talking to another alcoholic." What a beautiful thing! I mean, that's how this whole thing began, was one alcoholic talking to another. And that's what we do. And I talk to a lot of alcoholics. And so, you know, I got sober. And then I have to catch up with my life, because it's way out there somewhere. I don't have a job, I don't know where I'm going, I don't have a place to live, and all this stuff, the pressure. And so, you know, I said, well, they talk about this power greater than yourself. What is that? But, you know, I thought, well, surely if there's a chance of discovering it, it's going to be here, and it's going to be being, to some extent, having serenity. I mean, if I'm going to find something that works, I'm going to have to practice at being a little more calm than I used to be. And that's, that's practice, you know. It, it, for me, it's like the world is a mess. I sat at a coffee shop in Pacific Beach, and I watched the people go and hurry in here and there, and I thought, look at these fools. <laughs> and everything was wrong. And I stayed sober, and I went to meetings, and I was an empty vessel that made a lot of sound. And, you know... I'm here 22 years sober, and that has quietened down considerably. And, um, yeah, um, so today I spent the day making apple juice in Julian. And I manage an apple orchard with 3,000 trees. So... You know, they say be careful what you wish for, because you might just get it. And I sold some apple juice to a, a beer brewer in Julian, and he made some beer. And then a buddy of mine tells me, you know that beer that he made? It's phenomenal stuff. <laughs> so I thought, well, i got to go talk to the guy and just see how it's going. So I went to the pub in Julian, and he says, that beer is phenomenal stuff. He says, I'm going to get you some. So he fills up a glass of beer and he says, here. And I said, ooh, ooh. <laughs> no, no. 
I, what? <laughs> he says, well, you got to smell it at least. <laughs> so I said, oh, it's okay, I'll smell it. Wow. That's the best smelling beer that I ever smell in my life. And you know what? I drink a lot of apple juice. I drink the apple juice. And for eight, nine years now, I have managed an apple orchard in Julian. And it's open space. I have a job to do that, that I enjoy. It's hard work, and it's beautiful work. And it has been so incredibly fulfilling. And, you know, I said, okay, well, these people talk about this higher power. All right, so I'm going to say, well, I'm going to pretend that there is such a thing. I'm going to say, well, okay, let's see what you can do here. I mean, I got nothing. I got no happiness. I got no job. I got no car. I got a mess. Now, what can you do about that? <laughs> and, you know, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I believed, you know, I got me a book, and I read that thing. I mean, I sat at the coffee shop, <clears throat> and if you you know, if you find yourself sitting at the coffee shop and you're reading the big book, that is a very cool thing for an alcoholic to be doing. I mean, there's a lot of good books out there. Literature that's been translated into all kinds of languages. But our book here is one of the most life-changing pieces of literature that was ever written. And that book is all around this earth. And, you know, it's not easy to sit down at the coffee shop and open that book and start reading it. But that's an amazing thing to do. And I'll tell you something else that I found out. There are no extra words in that big book. There are none. Every word in that book, sooner or later, you're going to need to know them. You will. And I have had situations where <clears throat> things got really crazy. And I knew a guy that was sober, and I knew that he was a lawyer. And I thought, I'm going to call him, and he'd give me some good, solid advice. So I call him up. I said, hey, I need to talk to you. Okay. So let's meet. Okay. Okay. So we meet. So I tell him a little bit. I tell him like five words. He says, do you know what step 10 says in the 12 and 12? And I said, but hold on, I need a little bit of legal counsel here. He says, you know what, let's just take a look at what step 10 says in the 12 and 12. And I said, well, if that's what you think, that's what we'll do. And I am so grateful for people that know where these things are to be found in the books. And I was willing, I was willing to make that phone call. And I had that number. So I got 20, I have a 22-year token in my pocket. And when I sat there with my 90-day token, I thought, man, 22 years, things are good. All those ducks are going to be in a row. Every duck in the barnyard is going to be lined up perfectly when I get to be 22. And I can tell you what, that this year has been one of the most challenging years of my life, drinking or not drinking. And I can tell you that I have walked through a lot of pain this year. And, you know, I went back to Ireland in October and my father had cancer, and I sat and looked at him, and, and I knew that he was not coming out of this. And 22 years ago, 21 years ago, my father came to visit from Ireland, and, and he says, I don't see much change here. I mean, 
You're not going to work. You're kind of sitting around writing a lot. And what are you doing? And I thought, there's the reason why I'm an alcoholic. Right there. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to eliminate the problem. I'm going to tell him, get the hell out of here. Get out of my life. Because I can manage just fine without you. So I worked out a plan. And then I thought, well, damn it, I better talk to somebody about this. But surely they'll agree with me. Uh, so I, I went to talk to a guy, and I told him the story. And I said, you must understand that this is the only option I have. And he says, well... It sounds like you need to say something, but whatever you say, you need to say it with love. I said, what? I mean, whose side are you on? <laughs> so, you know, I didn't say anything. I never said a word to my father. And I went back in October, and I sat across from him, and he says to me, I'm glad you came. And I said, what else would I do? And he said, you could have stayed where you were. I said, no. And my father died in November, and everything between my father and I was good. And <clears throat> then my brother, they found his body in January in his apartment. And he was a year younger than me. Luke. Now, Luke came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And our book talks about those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. But many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. And Luke came to Alcoholics Anonymous and he was like, you know, the Bible and this and that and so, you know, he, Luke wasn't born that way. We used to go drinking together, and we hung out, and we went to New York together, and he just could never get this thing, and he, he, he had a hard time, and he spent 20 years diagnosed schizophrenic and taking medication and drinking when he had money, and so... Um, I, uh, was walking on the beach one day, and that's a beautiful day, and the sun is warm, and the sand is soft, and the ocean is amazing, and suddenly I have a resentment. There's two brothers in New York City that I need to go sort out a little thing that happened back in 1989. And we wound up in hospital after a fight in an Irish pub in New York City, and I decided I need to go back to New York City, and I need to see those boys, and I need to set this thing straight. And don't you know, I thought, well, they said call somebody. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I, there was a man that used to come to the meeting and he says, if you're an alcoholic and you have a resentment, you need to pray for that person. If you want to live and you want to be sober, that's what you need to do. That's it. And I had to think about that for a while. But you know, that's what I did because I did not want to drink. And that's exactly what I did. And I can tell you this, that those brothers wound up going back to Ireland and getting in a car crash a year later. And one of them died and the other one was paralyzed from the neck down. And I'd been doing a lot of walking on the beach. And my twins were born on June 29th of 2012. I have a little boy and a girl. And 
I feel so grateful that I get to have this experience. And my children, I am there for them. And they have not been damaged. They have not been damaged. And in some strange way, I get to go and do something for those children that I did not experience myself. And if you don't know that Alcoholics Anonymous works, and if you don't know some of the things that it says in this book, it says the great fact is just this and nothing less. That we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And that's the truth. That's the truth. I mean, my life today is so different than anything that I could have ever imagined. And I can tell you that our book talks, it uses words like happy, joyous, and free. And when I was sober, I thought, I don't even know what, what it means to be happy. I don't know what it looks like. And then I thought, well, that's cool because that's an experience that I'm going to have. And sure enough, I know what it means to be happy. Happy, joyous, and free. And that's a promise. Those words are meant exactly the way that they are written down. And it says, too, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. Now, no bartender, no drug dealer, nobody ever said things like that to me. (laughs) <laughs> here is something and you will be amazed before you're halfway through and this is something that you get to do for yourself and that is a beautiful thing because I know this is Saturday night and all of you have had a whole different experience with a Saturday night than this <laughs> And it's a big deal. And it's an amazing thing to sit in these chairs and to be sober. Because you know what those sirens sound like. And you know when those lights are flashing in your mirrors. And you can't count if there's two or four. (laughs) But you know that your life is going on a journey. And you may not want to do that and there's nothing you can do about that and so I met a guy in Julian and this man has walked 34,000 miles this past 14 years walked across the country eight times and I said Steve why did you start this thing I mean how do you just start walking and never stop he says well my son died he took his own life yeah and he was an alcoholic he says but we didn't know it we just couldn't see it and then my daughter died of a drug overdose so Steve goes walk and he carries a little sign and it says love life love life and I said, Steve, I mean, there's, there's exceptions to this, surely. He says, no, there's not. There's not. There's no exceptions. But Steve told me a little story. He says, you know, a long time ago they sent me to Alcoholics Anonymous because I'd got a DUI. <clears throat> so I went to a meeting, and the guy beside me goes like this. He says, you're going to have to introduce yourself as an alcoholic. Because this is a closed meeting. And he's like, well, I don't know that I want to do that. (laughs) So the other guy gives him a dig. He says, listen, 
I've been coming to this meeting for 11 years, and I never had a drink in my life. Where are you going to get this kind of therapy for free? <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, you know what? That was a wise man. That was a wise man. <clears throat> I don't know that I'd be going to Alcoholics Anonymous if I never had a drink. But, and we talk occasionally about normal people, but not very often. <clears throat> And I've met at least one in the 22 years that I've been sober. <laughs> now, <clears throat> this person left a bottle of beer at my orchard, and they didn't drink it, and it was a warm day. And I thought, that is the most unusual behavior. <laughs> and that bottle of beer troubled me. Because I looked at it. And, you know, what I can tell you about this person is that they are a happy person. And that their life is so full of being of service to other people. That's what they do. This guy is a doctor of Eastern medicine. And he's always working with other people. Medicine and acupuncture and stuff that's good. <clears throat> and he left a bottle of beer at my orchard, and it tormented me for a long time. And I thought, that's a normal person, God damn it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so, you know, I thought, okay, God, I'm willing, I am willing to be nobody. I'm willing to not have a name. I'm willing to walk and just be nothing. And I'll believe that I will find the thing that is mine. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote poetry, and I did metal sculpture, and I have been successful. I have been successful doing what I have done. And I have had a lot of, a lot of pleasure doing work that I have done. And now I manage an apple orchard in Julian, and I, I go out and I look at the stars, and I learn to breathe. Which, you know what, it seems pretty simple, but if you haven't tried it, I strongly recommend it. I breathing. And taking a walk. I know you're busy. I know that you're busy. But there's a mountain not far from where I found myself and Julian. And one day I just thought, the wind was blowing all the time. My father used to try to stop the wind from blowing. You son of a bitch! <laughs> and one day I just put my coat on and went with the wind up the mountain. And, and it was just a beautiful thing. And, you know, I do that. And when we say... When, when we talk about freedom, that's what, that's what we mean. We don't mean an excuse for freedom. We mean freedom. And it's an amazing thing. I'm working the steps now with a guy who has been sober a long time. And he approached me at a meeting recently and he says, hey, when was the last time you worked the steps? And I was very offended. <laughs> I said, well, it's been a while. He says, you know what, if you want to work the steps, we work the steps together. I said, wow, what a novel concept. 
like working the steps, and I'm working the steps with the, and, and with another alcoholic. And I talk to this guy, and this guy has been through a lot of stuff that I am going through, and I love it. My life, I love my life. I love the challenges and the the. It says that pain is the touchstone of spiritual growth. That's the trade-off. Hmm? You want spiritual growth? Well, this is the price. So, yeah, breathe and walk with that pain. Because some people have taken the alternative road. <clears throat> And there's some places, and some of you know what they are, the penitentiaries and the institutions and being so sick and so lonely. And look at us here in this room. <clears throat> and I'm just, I'm just so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous and the people that have came before me and that I can come here tonight and find this room full of alcoholics. So, <clears throat> our book, The Best Kept Secret in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's here somewhere. I know there is a book in this room somewhere. <laughs> Lots of them over there. Got to have a book. Got to read that book. Got to know what the words are. And, you know, the inventory. You get to sit down... <clears throat> And take a look at where you've been in your life. And that's a blessing. If you have been told that it's difficult, the state penitentiary for a long time is difficult. You know, the, the infraction with the police, where there was a blackout and a lot of things that nobody seems to remember. It's difficult. The crazy night where stuff got broken and people got hurt. You know, and, and it's hard to make amends when you weren't even there because you were in a blackout. That's difficult. Sitting down one afternoon and taking an inventory of where you've been is a friggin' great opportunity. And all these things are just amazing, because I'm a real alcoholic. And all those things were waiting for me, that state penitentiary, and still is. Mm. That hospital, that institution, mm. you know. So, I am a grateful, recovering alcoholic, and I'm glad to be here. And thanks for being here for me this evening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.